So I had to figure out for myself, like I was in the cave, the cave age, <laughs> the stone age. <laughs> Oh, you know, people in the cave age, they had to read Ulysses without an audiobook. Homestuck, the Internet's Ulysses. Or Hachu for short. This is the podcast where we compare Homestuck and Ulysses bit by manageable bit. I'm your co-host, Jamie, history of theology and French literature major. And I'm your co-host, Kira, resident update boy, because I just updated Skype for the first time in like four years. You can find me at K-I-Y-Y-E on Tumblr and Patreon and K-I-Y-Y-E-S on Instagram. And you can find me at jamietamar.wordpress.com and on Instagram as jamietamar. That's J-A-I-M-E-T-A-M-A-R. Um, I'm just going to make fun of you for a second. Kira didn't have the intro script open when we started recording, so we had to re-record the introduction. Nice. <laughs> Can you not remember that all you say when I pause is, or H-T-I-U for short? <laughs> no, I can't remember. It's too much for my small, tiny gay brain. <laughs> My brain is the size of a stegosaurus brain, which, if my memory of learning about dinosaurs in, like, second grade serves, is the size of, like, a walnut or some shit. That's adorable. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into these sexy reading questions. I'm going to start you off with a hard one. I'm very sorry. So the reading for Act 2 starts halfway through the act, just to break it up for us, and we get a little more exposition into Dave's home life and his bro situation so my question is what is the name of the application that bro uses to quote keep up with the ludicrous amount of websites and news feeds he monitors to stay hip on the scene to the scene absolute bullshit um that's close enough that i'll give you it yeah it's complete bullshit yeah that was one of the things where i was like he's gonna ask about this gotta remember it nice 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 yeah i'll give you that (laughs) <laughs> okay, my first question. Who does Steven imagine himself visiting at the beginning of the episode before his walk on the beach? His aunt? Yeah, can you remember her name, though? His aunt, who is named... Cher... Sally? I don't know, I think... You're going in the right direction. It starts with an S. Yes. Sally. Sally. No. Sandy. Close. Sandra. Sarah. No. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got Aunt it. Sarah and Uncle Richie Goulding. Mm. Okay. Here's the next question. This one's easier. What is the name of the device that Rose deploys near the uh, beginning of the reading that allows John to punch cards? Is that the one that looks like the piano? Yes. Is it an A? No. I am so off about which questions I think are easy and which ones I think are hard. It's just, like, all of the, like, mechanics. I'm like, what? Yeah, fair. Like, lore? I'm all there. Characters? Mostly there. Mechanics? That's, like, a fucking video game. I don't speak video game. (laughs) I thought I didn't speak video game until I did this podcast with you. Okay, the name of the device. I remember, like, I can picture it in my head, but I encoded it as the keyboard. So I don't know. Are you giving up? Can you give me a hint or something? It, it starts with the word punch. Is it like a silly homestuck word? Uh, no, it's not very silly. It's, Is it a I mean, real it's word? a, no, it's not a real word. It's about the same realness factor as alchemeter. Okay. I, no, I don't remember. I might remember, but I don't. Okay, it's a punch designix. I wouldn't have never gotten that. Well, I've stumped you. Yeah, you did. Okay, now stump me back. Why were Kevin Egan and his son Patrick in France? Oh, God. Uh, They were escaping. Uh, No, I'm not going to give you that. Okay, I have no idea. What's the answer? Uh, They are Irish revolutionaries in exile. Okay, I was thinking it was like a... Nationalism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think you're ideologically you're in the right direction but i'm not giving you escaping because like well i mean they were exiled but they aren't like in france in the process of escaping 
Yeah, right. Okay. That's a fair ruling. I should have specified my ideological direction. Okay. Um, here is this sexy anticipated four pointer. Uh, John uses the punch design X to punch a random code into a card, a random ass code, and then he alchemizes a bunch of useless items smushed together with the random code. Can you name all of the items that are in it, in the hodgepodge, all of them? Jetpack. Yep, that's one. Violin. Yes, that's two. Holy fuck. Uh, I can, like, picture it in my mind. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't. Need, I only encoded like three items. There are four. Well, there's four. I mean, the rocket pack is included, so there's there's three objects. Yeah, stuck no, I know. It. I encoded the rocket pack, and then there's like the violin on the left, and then there's like I don't know a brick on the right. I'll give you that. Really? Yeah. It's a cinder block. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I'll give you that for brick. Yeah, yeah, that's all I encoded. I didn't encode anything else. Okay. Well, the last one was a flower pot, but. Oh, okay, okay. You, you got yeah, yeah, three. Yeah. That was really good. Good job. Yeah, making up for, like, you know, all those other ones that I know haven't gotten. <laughs> okay, um, more on exile. Where does Steven find himself exiled from as he walks on the beach? Fuck. Did you read the Ulysses Guide for this episode? Oh, nope. <laughs> well, you're screwed. <laughs> um, He imagines himself... Oh, wait, it, wait, he's imagining himself exiled from somewhere? No, like, where does he actually find himself? Exiled is perhaps too strong, but that's how they... Symbolically, he's exiled. It's more just, like, where can he not get into? He, uh, the tower with Buck Mulligan? Yes. Oh, shit, really? Yeah, he he can't get into the tower because Buck Mulligan has the key. Oh, I'm a genius, guys. (laughs) Does he ever actually say that Buck Mulligan doesn't have the key? No, the narration just says he has the key. And do you know explicitly whether that's Steven or Buck? No. No. Some people have just decided, I guess, or, you know, read more attentively than we did and concluded that it is Buck. I think Steven meant that God had the key. Oh, yeah, you're right. He usually does, doesn't he? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Fourth homestuck question. What is the name of the firefly that the mayor frees from the amber? Serenity. Yes, correct. <laughs> yeah, I could, like I had forgotten about her and then it like happens and I was like, oh, and I actually had it in my notes. So I was like, wait, isn't she blinking something in Morse code? Because I thought that was like a theory that I read somewhere. And then like the next page was like, she's blinking in Morse code. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I was looking at the book commentary and Andrew like, like specifies Oh my god, I'm going to keep saying Andrew, because I was just listening to the Perfectly Generic podcast, and they always say Andrew. I should say Hussy, though, because I don't know him. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he like, specifies that all the times that she's blinking, it's actually saying something in Morse code, which I love. Uh, okay, ready for next Ulysses? I'm so ready. Hit me with it. What does Steven have a phobia of? God, what? They In the Ulysses guy, they literally mentioned the exact name of the phobia, and I had to, like, look it up. And I was like, like, you couldn't have just said he has fear of this thing? Like, Well, let's see. There's a, bo- there's a dead body. He doesn't like his dad. He's freaked out about dads. He has a dad phobia. Patrophobic. Is that actually it? No. If it was, <laughs> that would be an interesting parallel to... Homestuck, and maybe we can still make that parallel. <laughs> um, but no, he. Do you want me to give you the answer? Yeah, just yeah, yeah, just give me it. Dogs. Oh, really? Yeah, the dog that's like running around, like with its owner. Oh wait, yeah, and he was all like, "Oh fuck, I'm scared." Yeah. I forgot that all he like, was. Oh, Buck Mulligan, so brave, fighting wars, and here I am. Wait, let me find the quote. It was pretty good. It was pretty intelligible, and it will make sense out of context, is what I mean. He saved men from drowning, and you shake at a cur's yelping. It's very dramatic. It's very dramatic. This is Ulysses. It's very dramatic. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. Okay. Uh, This is my final Homestuck question. In the flash at the end of the act, which is Wayward Vagabond Ascend, Uh, We see an aerial view of post-reckoning Earth, and we see the crater where John's house was destroyed by a meteor. What is the thingy that grows in the place of John's house in the future? Uh, Like the frog temple? No, that happens, but that is not at John's house. Then I have no idea. Wow, really? Do I? It's in the flash. No, I don't remember. Okay. Well, the answer is a big tree. I mean, like, I believe you. 
I don't remember <laughs> that happening. And he yeah, was the, really transfixed by the frog. The big the big tree uh, grows in the place of John's house, and then it drops the the eggy looking thing, and, and that's Peregrine Mendicant Station. Was is there another the- Ulysses question? Yes, there is. Okay, hit me why with the final. Does, why does Stephen tear off part of Mister DC's letter on foot and mouth disease? Because he wants to write a poem on it. Yeah, do you know what the poem's about? Women. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that part. The Ulysses Guide is like, he tries to write a poem and then in parentheses, about a woman and a vampire, question mark? <laughs> questions. You got three out of five. What did I get? Oh, fuck. I'm not going to remember. You got five out of eight. So I'm at 10 and you're at six right now. So that boosts me up to 13 and you up to 11. Okay, good. Wow. Oh, okay. Now are we ready to do some summaries? Yeah, I'm ready to do some really bad summaries. This is a great new idea for a segment that I had, and it's called We Do the Same Segment from Before, where we summarize the readings, but we time ourselves to only have one minute to talk about them. This is better than before because of two reasons. First of all, because then we talk for less time and you're not bored. Second of all, because it'll be really, really funny trying to fit the entire summary of the reading into one minute. Let me see how this goes. So Steven starts out and he's like walking in, not in Dublin. He's walking somewhere. I don't remember where. Maybe Dublin. And then he's like, oh, I'm near my Aunt Sarah. Should I go visit her? And then he's like, oh, my dad would hate me for that. He would be so not surprised because that's how much he hates me. And then he's like, he imagines what would happen if he visited his Aunt Sarah's, but it doesn't actually happen, which is important to keep in mind. Um, Oh, well, that one. Oh, no, I've got 30 seconds. Okay, and then he walks past his house, and then eventually he's, like, walking on the beach, and he thinks about these guys who he knew when he lived in France, Um, and while he's walking on the beach, he's writing some poetry about women, Um, and a dog, and he sees, like, a dead body, and then a dog walks up, and he's like, oh, no, I'm so scared of dogs, and then he's like, too bad I can't get back to my home, because um, Buck Mulligan has the key. Time up. He sees good. a boat. The end. <laughs> a boat. The end. Uh, I can't believe we finished Ulysses. Uh, yeah, that's it. It's the whole thing. Ulysses is over now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, am I doing Homestuck now? Yep. So we started the reading halfway through Act 2. Uh, we start with some exposition on Dave and Bro. We see all of uh, Bro's fucked up hobbies and he does really strange things like high blood capsules and blenders uh, and swords in the refrigerator. And Dave starts to have a little bit of a freak out about the puppets uh, and he has a bunch dropped on him from the attic. There's some weird saw jokes in there. Um, And we also see a continuation of John and Rose's trajectory uh, John gallivants around his house some more and learns how to ar- alchemize things with the punch design X, which allows him to create mishmashes of objects. And then uh, at the end of the act, we see a bunch about the mayor and he gives us some important plot exposition through the creation of Cantown. Cantown. And then there is a big sexy flash in which his station blasts off and we see Peregrine Mendicant and a bunch of stuff. The end. Nice. Yeah. Can you tell I've read Homestuck seven times? I, yeah, I can. Um, <laughs> I, okay, this is not, like, comparative literature. It's just interesting. Is that the first time I read Homestuck, I remember, like, you know, this is, like, huge, home, well, not huge, but distant Homestuck spoilers. The conversation that Dave and Dirk had where Dave's all, like, actually, bro was, like, super shitty. Yes. Like, I remember when I read that conversation the first time, I was like, oh, he was kind of shitty, wasn't he? And maybe I was just stupid when I was in, like, ninth grade, which is, like, true and entirely why I interpret it this way. But, like, I know that the first time I read it, I definitely did not pick up on nearly as much of, like, Dave has so much anxiety. Like, it actually, like, like, he is so uncomfortable in this living situation. And he's kind of, like, he's the kind of person that Holden Caulfield is complaining about. (laughs) (laughs) Like, not that he's completely fake, like, he's being who he wa- who he thinks he wants to be, at least, but it's just, like, and he's not, like, you know, conforming to society as much as the phonies in Catcher in the Rye are, but he's so, he's so insecure, and he's, like, I don't know, it would make anyone anxious living like that. Like, you, you try to get food, and there's swords in the fridge, like, that's so fucked up. Um, yeah. 
And I think like reading it this time, maybe just being older, having more anxiety and also having read it already. And I'm like, oh, wow. Like, I I don't think I was ever supposed to think that it was an okay living situation. I think it was supposed to be one of those implicit, obvious things where you're like, wow, this is really fucked up. He needs to stop lying to himself. But the first time I definitely didn't get it. Well, yeah, it's interesting that you say that because uh, it's really interesting for me to look at how the fandom perception of bro has changed a lot over time. And I think... I, I mean, I think it's a valid point that maybe it was supposed to be implicit that we all noticed it. But uh, speaking from my experience in the fandom back in the early days, I don't think a lot of people noticed it. Maybe I just wasn't in the right circles. But like there were all kinds of like funny bro videos because I think a lot of home stuff presents itself as very comedic, you know, don't take me seriously kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, we get the same thing with like John's dad and that ends up being, you know, like John, John's dad is all like, oh, Harlequins and John hates it. And we make the parallel with that and bro and we're like, oh, well, Dave just like is, you know, he's overreacting and bro's not that weird of guy. But uh, as we get later in the comic, you really, really see the after effects of that living situation on Dave. And in retrospect, it's super obvious how fucked up it is. Like, for example, the quote where Dave's all like, the only way to keep food in this house is basically to hide it in the closet. And it's like, that's fucking weird. But I I didn't notice it on the first read through either. I didn't even notice it until like, I guess the, probably the fourth read through when, when we'd already reached the end of the comic and had those deep Strider bro conversations where Dave was like, yeah, he was shitty. And then Dirk was like, oh no, that was me. I feel like I feel like age, like the age at which you read it has a big thing. Cause like the first time you read it, you were like, what, 13? And I feel like a 13 yeah. year old definitely have an even less mature perspective on it than a 15 year old. Um, and I feel like most of the fandom too probably would have been about that age, like between 12 and 16 when they were first reading it. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe a bit older. But yeah, I think that could definitely influence um, how you perceive it. And it definitely has that vibe of like, haha, don't take me seriously. But I don't know. I feel like that's kind of one of the the cool things about it because like rereading it this time you know like it's it's a it's a thing in literature to have that kind of implicit explicitness where you know Mm -hmm. you know you don't say something but you're very much supposed to notice it like they're not trying they're not they're trying to be implicit but they're not trying to be subtle and Mm -hmm. i mean hussey's a great writer but he's not a novelist so i don't know to what extent he was actually trying to go for that vibe but as a literature major (laughs) <laughs> and as an 18 going on 19 year old it's definitely with with a lot of anxiety um it definitely reads to me like one of those things that's supposed to be like yeah this is fucked up and you're supposed to notice that and it's supposed to make you think oh wait because that's the other thing too is that I, the first time I read it I didn't really hate Dave as much as I do this time and I think one of the reasons that I don't like it is because I we all are holding Caulfield if we reach down deep enough and <laughs> and reading it this time, one of the reasons I don't like him is because he seems so fake. Not that if he were to, like, you know, undergo some intense self-honesty and be like, oh, how would I really be? He would necessarily be any less ironic. He he just, like, like it's that kind of, like, like, he wants to impress bro so bad. And it's, like, his projected, like, oh, I'm just so cool all the time is the kind of thing I see all the time. And that annoys me so much. Because I'm like, you don't have to want to feel that way. Like, you don't have to want to be cool all the time. You don't have to want to impress anyone. Um, and I think my perception of Dave is someone who's with so much deep-seated. And this time, like, I don't know. I felt like the first time I read it, his insecurity didn't come through until later. And it didn't feel like, oh, suddenly Dave is image insecure. It was just, like, a more gradual thing. But this time, like, right off the bat, I was like, oh, this is a very insecure 13-year-old boy with a very unstable home life that has a lot of anxiety and uncertainty that he has no idea how to process. And he's really struggling to go through it. <laughs> yeah, that's how he be. <laughs> I still don't really like him as a character. And I think he's definitely the kind of person who, if I met in real life, I would have no idea how to talk to him. Mm-hmm. But I can well, sympathize with him as a character archetype, definitely. Yeah, you know, I love Dave. I love I love all of the Strylons. And in fact, most of the Homestuck characters. Um, I think maybe you will grow to love him uh, when you see you know, on this, this, this read through all of the development he goes through in later pester logs, realizing that it is bullshit to try to like, you know, be ironic all the time in the bro style. And he becomes, yeah. Well, yeah, no, I'm definitely prepared for that. And it's not like, 
oh, I hate him. I think he's a bad character. I think he's a great <laughs> character. It's just that, like, if he was a real person, I would hate him, is what I Yes. Say. As, as a, a character, 13-year-old. I love him. But as, like, as a real person TM, I think I would find all of them incredibly annoying. Yes. Like him most of all. But I, this but might I, possibly be because they're all 13. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely very true. And that's probably yeah. why I find them more annoying this time than I did when I read it when I was 15. Because I yep. was 15. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, that's a normal age to be. It- um, Speaking of people who are insecure and broody, why don't we talk about Steven? Yeah, let's talk about Steven. <laughs> <laughs> He's insecure and broody. He's so insecure and all he does is brood. I okay. I did audiobook this time, so I didn't get the, so I had to figure out for myself, like I was in the cave, the cave age, the stone age. <laughs> Oh, you know, people in the cave age, they had to read Ulysses about an audiobook. (laughs) 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 They had to figure out, no, what I was going to say, they had to figure out for themselves which lines were narration. Like, I mean, it's all narration, but sometimes it's like first person and sometimes it's not. And it's Stephen either, it's about Stephen either way, but. Those people in the cave age, they (laughs) have to delineate themselves between Stephen's thoughts and the actual narration. (laughs) Back in the cave age. (laughs) I don't know what I was trying to go for. I'm in (laughs) evolutionary anthropology class right now. We just finally started talking about humans. Have you learned about the cave age? (laughs) Yeah, we're in it. (laughs) <laughs> oh wait we're in it right now but i thought we were past the cave age no in my class we're learning about the cave age <laughs> what's what's the cave age like <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> okay okay cave age aside <laughs> sorry uh, breaking boy. the stream of improv there <laughs> <laughs> it's good this is not my brother my brother and me um <laughs> Uh, yeah, I uh, well, I listened to the audiobook, but I was reading it without the audiobook before. Um, so, yeah, uh, Stephen, okay, can you explain to me the Hamlet hat? No. <laughs> well, fuck. <laughs> what do you mean explain? Well, he was like my Hamlet hat, and I don't really know what that means, because I don't know about Hamlet wearing a hat, specifically. I, yeah, I, oh. I was thinking maybe he was like, you know how you're like, you put on different hats, like in different roles, and he was like my Hamlet hat, but then I was like, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, I think that's how I interpreted it. Oh, no. Ulysses' guide only goes through Nausicaa. Oh, no. We're going to be on our own for the last five We're going to be in the cave age. We'll be on our own in the cave age. Ooh, it's okay. Is- I I th- there's this paragraph in um Proteus in episode three that's like where a Ulysses guide person was like I couldn't identify the speaker here and I thought about going to my Irish lit professor today before class and being like hi can you tell me who this who you think the speaker is in this thing but I feel like presenting someone even a Ulysses scholar with like an out of context Ulysses paragraph is probably not the best best way to go about getting an answer for it. Yes. <laughs> I just hate that. Um, maybe if you send me that later, we can scour the annotations thing I've been looking at on Wikipedia or whatever, wherever that is. So here are some things. Here's really quick a thing that I uh, noticed that is a parallel between the two. I feel like we've discussed this before, and this is definitely not a point that is unique to me. It's been made many times about Homestuck, but the first two acts of Homestuck do a really good job of setting up for the reader what the context of the world is and how the rules of the world work and i think ulysses uh does a very similar thing because you can see the delineation between uh the first two episodes which are like you know they're pretty wild but they're understandable and then in this third one you really jump into the like incomprehensible stream of consciousness stuff and i think the first two episodes do a really good job of setting you up for that so it isn't a shock and I think Homestuck does the same thing, setting you up for the massive flash at the end of Act 2 so that you're not shocked, but so that you are. uh, It's a good dose of shockage of of the the size and scale of the thing. Yeah, Yeah. no, I definitely think, like, the the level. He's like, I remember reading, like, the first time I tried to read Ulysses, and I've said this before, but, like, I read the first, I got through, like, the first sentence of the first episode, and I was like, oh, no, this is horrible. But then rereading it, I was like, this is just kind of like a normal novel. And I feel like the second episode is, like, you start to get into like Steven's thoughts, but it's still 
pretty novel-esque and yeah like it's yeah I mean, it still is a lot like I think the the contrast is bigger with Ulysses yeah I think more. Yeah, I think uh, the, I mean, Hussey said in his annotations for the uh, Act 2 book in in reference to the flash at the end of Act 2, this flash is often cited as a critical point of demarcation, which upon crossing, Homestuck ceases being merely an odd little story and starts being a thing that ruins your life and that of everyone you ever meet, (laughs) which is great. (laughs) That is wonderful and And very self-aware. Yeah, I know. Um, And so to that point, I think that flash is so epic to me like every time I watch it like even and even having the context of like Cascade and stuff which is even more epic it's still like so it's like ah all this stuff is happening and I but I think um episode three of Ulysses is not really the same as that it's not like you're not being exposed to epic plot points like nothing really happens it's just a continuation of the the craziness of the prose I guess yeah exactly yeah I have so many notes on Ulysses here because we read this like article in my Irish lit class about you about Joyce. Well, not about Joyce. It was about a bunch. It was about motherland and the idea of the Mm. mother represented in literature. Mm. And there was a bunch about Joyce and a bunch about Ulysses. So I took a bunch of notes and then I have a bunch of notes about some of the words in Ulysses. And then I have some annotations in Ulysses. Yeah, so I have I have many th- ways we could go with Ulysses. Was there anything else you wanted to say about um, Homestead? World setup. Um, I don't know. I think I pretty much covered it. It's it's very sexy the way it is done. Yeah, I think it's effective. Well, depends what you mean by effective. I think it is effective as it is. I think it is as effective as it is trying to be. I don't think if effective means you understand what's going on, then neither of them are effective. But if (laughs) effective means set out what the author wanted to do, then they are both effective. Yeah. And I think the other weird thing with Homestuck is that it spends, like, so long, like, in the beginning getting you set up for the world by going through all the, like, random shenanigans, which in part existed because it was a user command-based, like, thing. So people were actually suggesting things, which is why there's so many random bullshit panels. But... That, like, dissuades a lot of readers because they're like, nothing is happening until the end of Act 2. So... What do you mean it was user input? Did you not know this? No, I had no idea. What? Oh, my God. I can't believe we're doing a podcast and you didn't know this. I... No? How would I have known that? It's just common Homestuck. At the beginning of Homestuck, like, he on the MSPA forums, before they got wiped, like, he took user command like like people on the forum would give a command a bunch of different suggestions for commands of the characters to do and then he would take those and that's why it's so weird i did okay no i had no idea no i didn't (laughs) know that hey did you not know that because you're from the cave age (laughs) (laughs) yeah i guess so i don't think that's common knowledge it is so common knowledge i can't believe you didn't know that i mean i never really interacted with the homestuck fandom i mean it might have seemed like i was to you because i interacted with like you and like all of our friends but like on the internet i barely interacted with the homestuck fandom i mean i didn't interact with the era that the mspa forums were actually up and running like i came into homestuck after that had after user commands had stopped being a thing but like people told me I mean, I never talked to anyone about Homestuck. And you, so you never told me, so it's your fault. So you're the one in the cave age. Oh, no, I'm the one in the cave age. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's part of why the beginning is so weird. But it does a good job of setting you up for later stuff. But sometimes people get lost with all the randomness. I had no idea. Everything makes so much sense now. Is I that can't... where. Is that also where the names came from? Yeah, all of them. Okay, okay. Wow, I love that. I know, it's so great. How did I not know that? Okay, okay, okay. Tell me about Ulysses. Okay, where do I want to even start? Um, In the cave Well, okay, let's... (laughs) Stop. (laughs) Did you look up the meanings with the Nachinander and then the Nebeninander? I did, but now I have forgotten them. Well, luckily for you, I remembered and also have them written down. Um, I love the phrase, ineluctable modality. Yes. It's just so nice. 
So the intellectual modality of the audible is, um, I'm definitely pronouncing these words wrong and I am so sorry. I am so sorry. <laughs> um, the Nakanander, I'm going to pronounce it Nakanander. That's how I'm going to say it to be consistent. Okay. Um, is the an intellectual modality audible, which is um, intellectual modality of the audible means the unavoidable way that it is. And with audible things, it's inherently one after another. Ooh. Like things follow, like you can't say things that, mo like we're not the heptapods. We yeah. have to say things like one after another. But the intellectual modality of the visual is the nebeninander, which is things that, like, you imagine a painting, there is inherently no linearness to a painting. It's just all at once. Yeah, that's so true. And it's like, yeah, I just thought that was really cool. That's really sexy. So I didn't go, I didn't dig too deep there, but um, I just thought it was really interesting. And then I just reread, like, the first page of this, like, just now while I was waiting for the sound room to open. Um, and it said... There's the bit that's, won't you come to Sandy Mount, Madeline the mayor? And then it says, rhythm begins, you see, I hear. A catalectic tetrameter of I am's marching. No, a gallop, Deline the mayor. Which I think was so cool because as I was reading, like, won't you come to Sandy Mayor, Madeline the mayor? I was like, oh, that has two, like, stressed syllables in a row. That doesn't make sense. And then he literally says, no, a gallop, Deline the mayor. Because the Madeline, like, adds an extra stressed syllable that makes it not perfectly iambic. Ooh. And I figure that out on my own. I love how you were thinking that while you were reading that, and I wrote, uh, both have horse bullshit, question, question, question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That yeah. also, yeah. Uh, Homestuck is the internet's Ulysses. The horse bullshit is horse the answer bullshit. here. They both have horse bullshit, but I don't think the Homestuck horse bullshit is, like, in IMs and stuff. Oh, tragic. I'm just gonna, okay, that was my first thing from the episode. I was reading, I was on Facebook, and I saw, like, I think <laughs> it must have been an advertisement. It was, like, a link to an arc, a New York Times article talking about, like, famous um, pans of books that are now considered classics. Like, when a book would come out and then the New York Times would review it and like roast it. And then it turns out later that like everyone decided it was really good. Oh. And of course it was like, I was like, oh, I bet Ulysses is on here. And it was. <gasps> and it's what it said was James Joyce's Amazing Chronicle. James Joyce, a review by Dr. Joseph Collins on May 28th, 1922. A few intuitive, sensitive visionaries may understand and comprehend Ulysses, James Joyce's new and mammoth, mammoth volume, without going through a course of training or instruction. But the average intelligent reader will, will glean little or nothing from it, even from a careful perusal, one might properly say study of it, save bewilderment and a sense of disgust. Ooh, what a roast. Yeah, basically. It's a thick just, roast. Yeah, you're not going to get anything from it except disgust and confusion, which sounds like what people say about Homestuck. I was just going to say, it sounds a little bit like what people say about Homestuck. Hmm. I, I feel like a little bit of a difference, though, is that Homestuck, like, Homestuck oftentimes, the, the prose itself is understandable. It's just when you really get into the time bullshit is when people start not knowing what's happening. And also just the sheer volume of, like, words happening. People don't know what is going on with that. But, like... Joyce, sometimes you literally don't know, like, what the sentences mean. And Homestuck, you don't usually have that problem. So I feel like it's easier. I feel like maybe it's easier to convince people to read Homestuck than to read Ulysses. Oh, I, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Because you can be like, yeah, pe when people don't like Homestuck or when they're roasting Homestuck, it's not like, you can't understand this if you don't have uh, eight Optimistic Duelist videos open and uh, the complete Homestuck book series with commentary or else you will not understand it. It's just like, the first two acts are slow and it's gross and the art style's bad. Yeah, I mean, well, comparing it to like language, I feel like, you know, when you like, read a sentence in a foreign language and you're like, I know what those words mean, but I don't know what that sentence is. Yes. I feel like that's kind of how like like homestuck is but not in like a sentence sense but in like a narrative sense where you're like i understand each individual sentence but i don't really understand how it like 
combines into a singular narrative and then you read Ulysses and you're like none of these sentences are real yes <laughs> like usually they're not <laughs> <laughs> yes completely correct but no I also think that I mean this is like really interesting too but I feel like there's it's definitely easier to convince people to read Homestuck because partially the thing about Ulysses is that people have people like I tell people I'm reading Ulysses and everyone thinks it's like everyone's like oh oh Ulysses oh wow and they're either like super impressed and think it's cool or they just kind of like shrug their shoulders and like oh so pretentious but if you say you're reading Homestuck like pretty much unanimously whether someone has read Homestuck or not they're gonna be like ugh, Homestuck gross and I feel like the difference there is like people feel like you have to be smart to read Ulysses whereas people feel just like you have to put in a lot of effort to read Homestuck yeah and mayhaps there's an overlap between effort and intelligence Mm. (laughs) you know Mm. a thought or at least a correlation between effort and how intelligent you look yeah (laughs) anyone could sit in a library and hold Ulysses open in front of them what if you live in the cave age and you don't have a (laughs) then you have to invent the concept of a library and then you have to become James Joyce and write Ulysses yourself so that you can read cave Ulysses in your cave library (laughs) Cave <laughs> <Kate> Ulysses. <laughs> what were you talking about? Um, people not liking Homestuck and Ulysses. Yeah, but I mean, this all. Well, no, this started with me talk with the New York Times article that was like roasting Ulysses. Oh yes, right. Are there any like notorious Homestuck roast articles? You would know. You would know more likely than I would. I don't know if there are. I know a couple of notorious articles that are positive about Homestuck, but I don't know if I know any notorious Homestuck roast articles. Let me look up. Well, maybe that's another, I guess, difference just in terms of public opinion of the two, because with like with Homestuck, it's like a thing to hate it, whereas with Ulysses, it's like a thing to be a little like intimidated by it. So mm-hmm. you're gonna you're more like and also Ulysses is like a literary classic TM, which means you're more likely to find it's like we it's like more rare to find an article roasting Ulysses, and I feel like it's more rare to find an article eloquently explaining why Homestuck is good. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of notes about Ulysses, but I don't know what they mean anymore. (laughs) Well, let's find out. I have some too. Maybe they're the same ones. Well, most of mine are just I copy and pasted the stuff, and then I like wrote a key mash after it. (laughs) Okay, can you give cop- me a quote? I copy and pasted the um the one, his lips, lipped, and mouth to fleshless lips of air, mouth to her moom, oom, al wooming tomb. <laughs> Where is that? What? You didn't have that? I don't remember it. I can't believe you could have read that and not, like, marked it up. His mouth, molded, issuing breath, unspeeched, ooh ha Oh, I found it. <laughs> I was reading that and I was like, Stephen, are you okay? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I do not think he's okay. Um, oh, there's this one. This is like one of the many quotes I pulled from the article we read in my Irish lit class. But it said, in Ulysses, Joyce deploys one kind of myth to demythologize another. And I just thought it was funny because he uses the word deploys. <laughs> like <laughs> the actual word. Like, the way I have it quoted is, quote, in Ulysses, Joyce deploys, unquote, heh, quote, one kind of myth. <laughs> okay um i would like to read i had this idea that we should find quotes from either homestuck or ulysses and then say like try to guess which one they are and then after i had that idea we realized that the writing style is just too different but this is a quote from homestuck that expressed a very irish sentiment mayors are so much better than kings you hate kings and you think kings are really stupid They are petty, bossy tyrants and are really full of themselves and are basically awful in every way. God, do you hate kings? Which is just like a huge Irish Revolution mood. (laughs) Yeah, it is. Like everything we're reading about, like the IRA, like it's all just like, wow, England fucking sucks. (laughs) The mayor should have like an Irish accent in the Let's Reads. Oh, yes. Well, does the mayor talk? Oh, yeah, the mayor, of course. The mayor, yes, like, yells. The mayor yells angrily. That would be so perfect. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm, I'm imagining the voice for him in the Let's Read, and then now I'm imagining it Irish, and it's better. Yes, you're 100% right. Okay, do you want to read your quotes, or do you have anything else? Um, No, I have, I have nothing else. Do you want me to start, then? Yeah, you go first. 
These heavy sands are language tied and wind have silted here. That's sexy. Which is almost three feet of iambic pentameter. It's definitely like these heavy sands are language tied and wind have silted here, which is, I think, why I like it. Also, the fact that it has the word language in it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> probably. Okay. Um, okay, you want to read your Humsa quote? Yes. Okay, this is a quote that, okay. I'm going to break the rules a little bit. This is a quote from Andrew Hussey's commentary from the books. It's not an actual quote from Homestuck. There are a couple of good quotes from the actual Homestuck text that I saved. But this one is so much better. And it's also very relatable. And also the best thing I've ever read possibly in my whole life. So this is right after Hussey talks about, like, something about his psych out winning a Pulitzer Prize or something. What? Okay. He, like he does like you know how he does like psych out it's when in the middle of the flash it's like something is about to happen oh, yeah. or like a panel and then it's like psych out and then you do something else yeah so he was making a joke about like if you did that in a dickens novel you would get a pulitzer pl- prize but he doesn't get one and so this is his quote try to imagine all the pulitzers in the world melted down and their prestigious alloys then smith to form a kind of battle armor specifically tailored to my proportions now imagine that I become the last boss in the literary world. Are you imagining it? The dream we share is what unites us as human beings. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. And now I really want to draw him with like the Pulitzer armor, last boss in the literary world. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's so funny. <laughs> um, This was homestuck the internet's ulysses you can find us at htiu.tumblr.com and htiu.podbean.com and on spotify and itunes and google play Ooh, are we on google play we are we were last time in the last episode where i was like i think we should be on google play i checked the next day and i'd already done everything so yes we're on google play now we are yeah we we have been for a while in fact all right so now we're on google play yeah and is there any more exciting Oh, and um, we're going to be at Anime Boston. Uh, we already talked about this in the last episode, but uh, we're going to be at Anime Boston on Saturday in the Prudential, dressed up as Hussey and Ulysses, and maybe we'll have free stickers Hussie or something. Hussey and Joyce. H- oh, nope. <laughs> Hussey and Joyce. Hussey and Odysseus is who we'll be dressed up as. Yeah, and then probably Dirk and Rose later. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. 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 Welcome to the cave age. <laughs> Welcome to the cave. <laughs> Our new podcast. <laughs> and that'll be it. That'll be it for the day. <laughs> yep. Thank you for listening. See you next time on Hit You. Bless you. <laughs>